Good evening. My name is Manina Jones, and I'm Chair of English and Writing Studies at Western University. Like today's featured writer, Emma Donahue, I address you from London, Ontario, which is situated on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapuuk, and Atawandran peoples. These lands continue to be home to diverse Indigenous communities whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors to our society. It may feel a bit odd to give a land acknowledgement in this virtual form, uh, but I would encourage everyone to take solo writer Lee Maracle's advice. The land is there, she says. It's alive and it's all around you. The spiritual, ecological and historical world is all around you everywhere all the time. So you might as well say hello. It is a great privilege today to welcome Emma Donahue. Born and raised in Dublin, Ireland, she holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge, as well as an honorary doctorate from Western. She's a longtime resident of London, Ontario, where she and her family currently reside. Emma began composing poetry somewhere about the age of 10, and from what I can tell, has been writing literary scholarship, poetry, novels, short stories, radio drama, children's fiction, plays, film and television screenplays, essays, pretty much nonstop ever since. She has done so to considerable acclaim. Her fiction ranges not just in genre and style, but from contemporary settings to the historical, as in her recent novel, The Pull of the Stars. Based on her highly regarded novel, Room, Emma Donahue wrote the screenplay for the film of the same name, which was nominated for four Academy Awards. Strag tragically, the play she adapted from her novel for the Grand Theatre here in London, Ontario, was cancelled on its opening night due to COVID-19. As we all went into lockdown in March, the story of Room took on new dimensions. In describing the forced imprisonment of a young mother and her five-year-old son, Jack, in a tiny single space, Emma Donahue named our feelings of isolation, loneliness, and confinement. But Room also vividly portrayed the power of the imagination to exceed such limitations, showing us how play and creativity through books, drama, the arts, have the power to connect us and keep us going during difficult times. With that essential principle in mind, I'd like to extend warm thanks to the London Public Library and the organizers of WordsFest for supporting and celebrating the arts and creating community even when we're physically separated. That's something to celebrate. Emma Donahue's most recent novel, The Pull of the Stars, now an international bestseller, takes place over three days in an understaffed hospital in Dublin, Ireland, during the height of the great flu pandemic of 1918. In a tiny closet of a makeshift ward, nurse Julia Power, with the aid of Bridie Sweeney, a young volunteer who turns up seemingly out of nowhere to help her, tends to expectant mothers who have contracted the flu and who must experience their confinement in the confinement of quarantine because the flu makes them and their babies vulnerable to life-threatening complications. The novel was conceived in 2018 when COVID didn't even exist. Submitted to the publisher in March 2020, just before the recent pandemic began, this novel has been called spooky, prescient, and uncanny, but I like to think of it as timely. So I thought I might begin by asking Emma to talk about the timeliness of her novel. First, Emma, welcome. Can you say something about how fiction about the past sometimes really hits nerves with present day audiences? Sure, thanks Manina and thanks so much to WordsFest for having me back and London Public Library. Can I just give a little shout out, London Public Library no longer charges fines. Could there be a more concrete way to make libraries accessible to all, to make everyone feel welcome there? So well done. In the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> what a wonderful move. Anyway, um, yeah, to answer your question. Um, you know, I think historical fiction, if it's done well enough, will always have things to say about today. And, and I don't think that means that you have to approach it in a spirit of, oh, how can I comment on today in, in direct forms? It's more that if you go really all in on any era in the past, and if you pay close enough attention, you're likely to say something lastingly true. So in this case, everything I wrote was about the great flu of 1918 and not about COVID, um, because really I'd, I'd signed off on the book by the time COVID came along. But 
it seems that you know the, the same things happen in every era not only the the basic you know terror of the outsider you know um vague fears about how you might catch this invisible germ but also things like politicians blaming the victims um people both desperately wanting to help each other and being afraid of each other those same things play themselves out so i've always found that if you approach the past with you know the concerns of today even if your novel scrupulously avoids anachronism you are going to end up saying something which is which is relevant to today and um, in this case it was just that the timing was was uh, almost alarming to me because i really didn't intend any connection and the book wasn't even meant to be published until next year but just as so many writers found their publication put off suddenly i was getting a call from my publishers to say can we bring it out in july i didn't even know big literary publishers could work that fast because usually they assure you that they need at least a year for everything so it's kind of funny to see that they can absolutely you know fling all the skilled people together to you know really beautifully copy edit and design and, and bring out a book and and my american publishers even they got me the copy editor I'd had on The Wonder, who was an emergency room doctor as well. So mm. I, she was literally going between COVID patients and my text. So I really felt this obligation to get the medical stuff right with her help. And I also had a wonderful um, midwife in Hamilton, who I consulted on all the midwifery in the book. And again, she was quarantined due to COVID. And so I was getting this, you know, absolutely from fresh from the cold face medical advice from from two people to try and make sure the novel would be as true as possible did you actually make any revisions to the book in the process of it coming out after you'd submitted it to you know to sort of reinforce any of those connections with the present moment the only thing i remember is that i had i had deliberately not used the word pandemic in my novel because even though that was the correct word it, it didn't sound very 1918 it sounded very sciencey and jargony and so i thought i thought my impression was that most people would have just call it you know the flu or an epidemic so i said epidemic but suddenly in april pandemic was an absolutely normalized word it was one of our bits of new jargon that everyone was using so i thought oh, actually i can afford to say pandemic that's all I remember changing. Um, I didn't need to add anything to make it relevant to today. And it would have been, you know, a, a fairly crass thing to do because the novel was trying to be so true to 1918. Um, so no, I just, I just, you know, tried to make it as true as possible and really correct any remaining medical errors of mine. I don't have a science background at all. And I'd, I'd work desperately hard to try and um, be accurate both about the birth process and about the flu. And in some cases, I even sort of used my own confusion. I remember you know, looking between my notes on what a particular patient, patient of Julia's, what her flu would be doing to her blood pressure. And then I was looking at what her pregnancy would be doing to her blood pressure. And I was thinking, should Julia put her with her head high or with her feet high? And then I thought, I can use this confusion. You know, <laughs> even Julia will be confused at this point. So I actually wrote a little paragraph where she's like, legs up, head up, where do I put her? Um, so, so no, I didn't, I didn't sort of COVID it up at all. Um, <laughs> already it was just it was just um you know weirdly similar um but i think the same would be true perhaps of, of any novel which pays really close attention to healthcare workers during a pandemic um you were saying that you consulted with medical experts and uh talked to people in the course of writing the book but there's also an awful lot of historical research there um where did you go to do that and what kinds of sources did you consult it almost you know the, the medical stuff almost feels like you got a medical degree to write this um but how did you find and and also the the historical information so what kind of research did you do and then how did you find a way of integrating that into the plot well as a kind of a not so much a lapsed academic but i was planning to be a prop a prop and then i you know went off those rails and onto the fiction rails instead. But it means I always like to give a shout out to the many um, academic researchers and in particular historians who novelists draw on. It's, you know, people often have the impression that we're off in archives looking at primary sources and we're the first to dig something up. Not a bit. Um, you know, during the <laughs> pandemic, I was ordering up, um, no, even before the pandemic, sorry, I was ordering up obscure books on, you know, the, the training of midwifery students in Ireland in the 1890s um uh, exactly what advice there would be for breastfeeding women in 1910 you know that kind of um, book from the time but also a lot of very specific histories um histories of the flu i'm thinking of ones like say nancy bristow's book american pandemic um and i read uh, about the flu from all over the world really because i was trying to 
to, to gather those insights into how it played out in many different countries. And I, I started keeping a file on what, what um, governments in each country said to their population, because you know the details may have varied, but the same basic principles came up of governments giving false reassurance to try and keep the economy ticking along or, or keep morale up in the case of the countries that were at war. The very reason they call it Spanish flu, that's basically like Wuhan virus, but it was a bit of propaganda language that stuck was never Spanish. And the Spanish were just open about the fact that the flu was running through their government because they weren't in the war. All the countries fighting the war were like, don't call it English, don't call it German. Um, so the flu seems to have originated in Kansas, in fact. So um, yeah, I was very interested in the way um, government information signage and so on would, would, would basically try and um, you know dampen down fear, but also often implied that really it was your personal responsibility not to catch this. It would say something like, you know, defeatism less than disease mm. would imply that it was your weak mind that was somehow letting the germs through or your failure to to access sunshine, for instance, you know, there'd be signs saying seek out fresh air and sunshine. And I would I'd have been looking at, you know, pictures of the Dublin slums and the damp wallpaper peeling off the walls. And I would think, where are they meant to find fresh air and sunshine in a Dublin November, you know? So, so yeah, I found that the sources were, were absolutely fascinating and I, I used the work of so many different historians to access those. Um, so I'm, I always, you know, I always end up with, with too long a bibliography to possibly be able to credit everyone. Um, but I know myself, you know, because I've done academic research too, so I know how kind of unappreciated that is. You have to just do it for the sheer pleasure and satisfaction of getting all the little details right. But um, as a novelist, I always feel deeply grateful to those who've really put in the time in the archives so that someone like me can kind of sweep in and say, oh, show me what medical training was like in the 1910s. <laughs> um, the, uh, the propaganda finds its way in in this kind of direct way. It's quoted in the text um, almost as if we see the posters announcing all of these um, slogans and um, pieces of advice, eat an onion, eat an onion a day, um, if you feel ill, um, you know, uh, have yourself taken care of for two weeks. Um, yeah, that's another bit of advice. It sounds like it's only relevant to duchesses, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so often in recent months, you know, I've seen the government say something like, you know, make sure to work from home. And I'm thinking, oh, great. How is that possibly relevant to the guy who's delivering groceries, you know? Mm. Um, so, so. Yeah, I, 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 all those bits of government advice in the book, you know, none of them are direct quotes, but they're all based on lots of, of government advice from different countries. And I was trying to kind of capture the surreal feel of it, these, these kind of smug slogans, often rhyming, for instance, where they would put them in very sort of snappy phrasing. And they were so, you know, irrelevant to the reality of actually, you know, pushing your way onto the tram and living cheek by jowl with people or possibly trying to keep yourself safe while working in a hospital. Um, so I found I found that the you know the, my fictionalized government advice posters a very good kind of punctuation device because they're so different from the actual mm -hmm. flavor of daily life during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, one of the things that struck me about them is that it almost feels like you're passing the posters. Um, and I was thinking about the way you've integrated so much historical and medical detail. Um, but there's a lot there that had to come really out of your imagination. And one of the things that um, impressed me so much about The Pool of the Stars is the ways in which it has the texture of the time, that sense of being in the place. And that's partly because of smells and tastes and um, sounds that you hear in the background. And I'm, I'm just wondering how you go about getting yourself in that mindset. I suppose I, I tend to use a, a single point of view. It, it might occasionally in a book move to somebody else, but it's always one person's point of view. I'm never the omniscient narrator. I've even tried things as omniscient narrator. And after about two pages, I'm like, I, I call BS on this. I don't believe in this floating camera. You know, much as I enjoy, say, the novels of Dickens, I, I need to be in somebody's head. I need to be in somebody's skin and smelling what they smell. Um, so, so once I have a protagonist like, say, Julia Power, and I decide, OK, I'm, I'm going to work and I'm on the tram, you know, I'm really sort of shutting my eyes and thinking, okay, how much are the other passengers squeezing close to me? And, you know, oh, I'm smelling eucalyptus from somebody's collar because they're hoping that smell will ward off the, the invisible germs. Um, I, I try and really, really inhabit their skin. You know, especially with this novel being about a pandemic in the middle of a global war, I knew there was a real danger that if I tried to take on too much, 
um, it would it would get too thin. You know, I, I don't really have an epic imagination. I, I like to go in close. And in particular with this one, I, I really sort of, you know, said to myself, I refuse to feel obliged to describe World War One plus what the epidemic, what the pandemic was like worldwide. I, I refuse to give those statistics. I'm going to go in really close and give you just three days in one small ward because oh. I, I feel if I do that intensely enough that you will feel you have lived through the entire pandemic. But I needed to commit to just sort of one time and place and and just just a cluster of um, of patients. Um, I suppose in a way, in the same way as you know, a nurse or a doctor or a midwife, they can't heal everybody. They have to just work desperately hard to save the life in front of them. You know, that's not the same as being a public health expert. They have to just commit to the person sick right in front of them. It, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when I started to read the novel, you know, I knew about World War One. I. I knew about the Spanish flu epidemic, and I knew about the Irish rebellion, but. I never imagined that there was one place in which they all happened at the same time. Um, and taking us into that world is um, just tremendously engaging and invigorating. Um, and as you said, you're, you're, in there, you're in that world from the point of view of a single person experiencing it. Um, I was thinking, you, at, at one point, I think it's on your website, you comment that when you did revisions for Slammerkin, your editor said, more London. Um, you know, give me more of the feel of the place. And I really got the feel of the place in Dublin at that particular time. And well, you know, one reason I chose Dublin, I could have set this novel anywhere. Um, my, my kind of hook was the, the fact I came across that women in late pregnancy were the most liable to catch the flu and have terrible side effects. I thought that was very interesting because they would have such complicated medical stories. Each of them would have sort of two different medical dramas running simultaneously and the birth, the birth might go well and the flu badly or vice versa. And birth is in itself so wonderfully unpredictable. I don't know why people don't write about birth all the time because it's fascinating. It's it's not even an illness, but it can kill you. You know, it's such a mixture of potential, you know, happiness and horror, or sometimes the two muddled in together. Mm. Um, but anyway, yes, I, I could have chosen a maternity ward anywhere, but I thought, okay, I'll go for Dublin because it's my hometown and I think I can make the voice convincing. But also I knew that Ireland had been through such an up, a political upheaval in those years. I mean, you know, very roughly in 1916, when we had this, mini revolution for six days in Dublin, most people were opposed to it. Most people would have seen this as like really either nonsense or terrorism. And it, you know, 10 years later, we had a, a free country. We'd broken away from British rule. So people went through such a political transformation in that time. Um, and I thought, you know, that would just add to the sense of like, you know, the old order is falling apart. You know, the status quo has shattered. Everything's up for grabs. Um, you know, I'm going to snatch a question from the Q&A as I see it, because oh. it's so relevant to this. And um, Cherie, or... Sure, go ahead. Cherie Stewart, why did you make Julia's brother nonverbal? Okay, this is was one example of how it's not that I could ignore World War I, but I, I had to keep myself rooted in, in Julia's three days in her ward. But I thought if her brother was a war veteran, that would be a lovely way to evoke this, this grand drama, which, as you say, Manina, you know, we tend to think of these as separate topics as if they are successive items on a timeline when in fact, you know, history overlaps, it's all very messy. So I thought, okay, Julia's brother, I wanted her to, to live, um, I didn't want her to be married, but I didn't want her to live with a big gaggle of nurses in a lodging house either, because I wanted her to have a, and us to have a break from the hospital. So I thought she could live with her brother and if he's um, a war veteran, that will evoke all that damage done. And I thought, do I give him, you know, a, a scarred face or a missing leg or something? But then I thought, Oh, if he's mute, that would be a lovely way of suggesting the damage. You know, he he looks fine, but something is deeply hurt in him. Something is deeply damaged. And it's he literally he can't explain it. He won't explain it. Julia has to deduce it. So I thought it was a, a lovely way to talk quite subtly about mental harm rather than if he's, say, you know, lying awake, having screaming nightmares or being violent or anything. It, it, it keeps it wonderfully implicit. Um, and it was, a, it was a nice challenge for myself as a character to sort of bring him to life without him saying a word. And, you know, like, like pre-verbal children, he's very evocative. He's actually a terribly caring and able person. He, you know, grows vegetables on the, the allotment and makes dinner and keeps it warm for her. And he tends a magpie. So he, he does a lot of things without saying a word. So, um, yeah, Tim ended up as one of my, one of my favorite characters. Um, I think Catherine Leggett in the, um, in the questions was asking about uh, the character of um, Kathleen Lynn, um, who is one character that you have actually kind of pulled out of 
the historical materials and fleshed out as a character in, in the book. Can you talk a bit about her? Sure. Um, I mean, those who read some of, my, some of my books will know that I quite often use historical um, characters or incidents, but I would usually distinguish between my books that are fictional and my books that are sort of fact-inspired fiction. And this one was going to be purely fictional because I thought the pandemic with the background of the war was more than enough fact for me to be pinned to, because every fact is, it's a bit of an effort to have to honor the facts of a life, for instance. So in this case, I wanted to be absolutely free to make up my characters. So I you know, made up Julia and Bridie um, to, to serve the story and all the um, patients. But I, I just wanted some background on Irish doctors of the time. And as soon as I started looking into Irish doctors, who should I find but Kathleen Lynn, who I couldn't have made up, in that she was, I needed a, a doctor who would be brought in as a locum just temporarily to this hospital, an outsider. So I find this doctor who was not employed full time by any Irish hospital because the men didn't want to work with a woman. And she had qualifications in midwifery. She was running her own flu clinic on the side, sponsored by her lifelong woman partner. She was a suffragist, she was a labor rights activist, and she, was, she had fought in the 1916 Rising, had gone to jail for it, and was on the run from police during the few weeks, uh, during that period in which my novel is set. So you can see I couldn't resist her, you know? And I thought she would have this ability to, to sort of deduce the political meaning from what she's looking at. You know, Julia is so close up doing the nursing. She can't be stepping back and saying, well, an interesting conclusion that I draw is, you know, she, and Julia wouldn't be likely to have the same kind of intellectual sweep, um, but I, Dr. Lynn would. And so I thought she would be a huge addition to the book. But at first I tried to keep her fictional. I thought I, I don't want to have to bring in all that revolutionary politics. It's all too complicated. So um, I'll just give her a fictional name and I'll kind of minimize her contributions to the book. But my agents and my editors all said, tell us more about this doctor. You know, So I found myself not only giving her her, her true name, but also allowing her to to speak more about politics and to start kind of converting Julia. I mean, in the first draft, Julia just says, oh, I don't have any time for politics. I was trying in a way to, to honor Julia's sort of feminist commitment to keeping these women alive and not let her think about any other politics. But my American agent said to me, um, we're living in the era of Trump, Emma. You either write an escapist bit of fluffy fiction or you write fiction that takes politics seriously, but you can't do something halfway. So you, she said, your novel is in fact very political. So you have to allow Julia to start to start noticing this. So that's a good example of how, you know, I'm a big planner and I do a huge amount of thinking in advance, but I don't always see what in my book needs to change. So I hugely appreciate the early input of, of my um, two agents and, and three editors. You know, it's kind of like an early focus group. So when they ask me for more of something, whether it's give us more 18th century London or give us more Kathleen Lynn, I tend to listen. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, so we've met in, the, in, the, in our conversation thus far, we've talked a little bit um, about Julia um, and Kathleen. Can you tell us something um, about Bridie? Uh, sure, it's really a novel of three women because I didn't want it to be just a kind of binary of, you know, here are two women so different. So I thought three would be interesting and it would be a kind of a spectrum of power and status in the hospital from a doctor who, okay, she may be, you know, gossiped about and on the run from police, but she's still a doctor through a nurse midwife who would have been relative, relatively subordinate in the hospital hierarchy. And only the fact that the hospital is, is crazily understaffed um, at the point when I'm writing, that gives Julia quite a lot of authority that she wouldn't usually have had. And then I thought I want to complete nobody as well, because um, well, haven't we seen this year how important all those people working in hospitals are? You know, it's the, the person who cleans the floor, the person who brings the food in. It's all a crucial part of that kind of net in which we are held when we're hospitalized. So I thought um, I want a, 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 a helper, a nobody. And um, this was partly because when I was, you know, I had I had elaborate notes on all Julia's tasks. And some of them I thought she just couldn't possibly do single-handed, even if it's only a three bed ward, like changing the bedclothes. So I thought she needs a helper. And I, I want that helper to have, you know, as little uh, status as possible, as little education as possible. And because then that helper will be a complete newbie who doesn't know anything about this world of, of early 20th century medicine and who will need everything explained. So an outsider character is always very, very useful to the reader, frankly, because the reader doesn't know about, you know, asepsis and so on. Um, so, so yeah, Bridie comes in um, with, uh, in a way, no training, no nothing to equip her for this, except lots and lots of natural, natural talents, natural intelligence, curiosity, 
um, human warmth. Um, and, if, you know, by being there at the right time in the right place, she is hugely useful to Julia and to the women on the ward. And she she blooms because she's finding that she has interesting and useful work. Um, quite a few nurses and volunteers from the 1918 pandemic, they, they said afterwards that this was like the best time of their lives. I think so many women were underutilized then or just sort of stuck at home. And so to find themselves actually saving lives when so many of the men were away, it was a huge thrill to them. It was grueling work, but a big thrill too. So I like the idea that, you know, that the Bridey would in fact um, find it absolutely thrilling to, to be granted such useful work. And that in this intense room, um, Bridie and Julia and Dr. Lynn would all get to know each other very fast and and a real intensity would build up really as quickly as possible. I suppose I was I was asking myself whether whether um, human connection could could grow as fast as a virus. You know whether the whole thing could happen in three days. You know I, I had a kind of a either a viral timetable or you could say kind of a childbirth timetable for everything in this book. You know <laughs> can I can I change all these lives in three days? Mm. Yep. Friday kind of lights up the story when she comes in. I think partly because she thinks of this as an adventure. It's all a kind of a learning experience for her. Um, I have a question uh, from the questions uh, on the connection between Room and the Pool of the Stars and the fact that they both take place in very restric restricted spaces. The ward room um, in the Pool of the Stars is an improvised ward room because they need somewhere to put the women who are expecting children. Um, and a lot of the drama takes place in that. It doesn't exclusively take place in that space. So um, is there a metaphor yeah. there? Yeah, and I would say also um, my novel, The Wonder, much of that happens in one little room where a girl is, is, is sick in bed because she's trying to live without food. So those three, um, yeah, they, they each do have a single key room. Um, Sometimes I feel a little sheepish when I spot these repetitions, you know, but then I think artists do this all the time, you know, they're allowed their obsessions. Sometimes it takes more than one book to work something out. And I think the, the, the obsession with the single room, it's partly simply as a literary technique, it works. It's like the, the Agatha Christie locked room murder mystery. I absolutely love the intensity that builds up between people when you, when you trap them together. Um, and I tend to limit their time as well. Um, I think of it as the unities of time, space and action you know, um, uh, that that just, you know, where a story might easily get too diffuse or, or, or stretched out, you know, if you if you limit it, if you make it all happen in half an hour in one room, it's, it's likely to benefit. But also, I'm very interested in the history of women and, you know, women's history has mostly been a matter of confinement, <laughs> whether in the sense of giving birth or being stuck at home. And I can think of so many different situations from, you know, girls not allowed to go to school under the Taliban to Greek villages I've been in where you don't see any women. It's as if they've all died out, but no, they're at home making the dinner, you know? So, so many different settings in which women's lives have been too circumscribed and too domesticated. So um, I suppose when you start looking at women's lives and um, the question of whether to kind of stay in the room or what chance you have of getting out of the room just does naturally arise. And in the case of room, I would say that the room was also a, a metaphor for the womb. Um, there was kind of a, a, a pun that was was built into that story from the start and the idea of like the, the mother is the safe small place and then you know uh, you have to burst out into the wider world. Um, so by the way, I'm going I'm to spot one question from um, Kirsten Smith. She says that horrific first delivery was it based on real events? Yes, my own. Um, I not only put in a few births of, of friends of mine into this book, but um, uh, I had a, our first birth um, went great, except afterwards there was just one little difficulty. You may not have wanted to know these details, but you know, the placenta wouldn't come out. So suddenly um, Dr. Usher, a local gynecologist, rushed in and basically got it out with, with her hands in five minutes. And um, I realized afterwards, oh my God, that's, that's the moment where I feel my privilege. That's the moment where I would have died if I was living either in a previous century or in a place on this earth where you don't have access to good medical care. You know, this is the moment where my life diverges from all those less lucky lives, you know. Um, childbirth is the, is the thing that routinely killed so many of our ancestors. So I've never felt quite so, you know, lucky um, to have had access to healthcare. And so I saved that memory for 16 years and then I popped it into this book, but from the point of view of the midwife. And um, 
yeah, I, I, it, it, there's a peculiar satisfaction to using autobiographical material, but from a different, very different point of view. Um, for instance, my last book, Akin, was all about um, the years in Nice that Chris and I have been lucky to spend because of um, Western's um, French exchange in Nice. But I gave all my thoughts to a 79 year old man. So it's, it's just this, it's really fun to kind of revisit your own life stuff, but, but from a different angle. You know? It's such a, um, you were talking about the single room, um, and it's such an intimate, like anybody who's had, who has children has birth stories. Um, and you've managed to sort of weave a whole bunch of them into this, um, but they're such intimate stories. What was it like to translate them into a um, sort of a more public form of storytelling? I really enjoyed it because, you know, I, I think birth is so typically glossed over, or if you see it on TV, it lasts maybe 30 seconds. You know, it's, it's always so dramatic, you know, the the water is bursting all over the carpet and um, the, the sudden kind of keeling over in agony. You know, it's always the, the most high speed form and then one kind of uh, and then beautiful baby. You know, and I wanted to capture the way it's it's a slog. It's an effort. I have friends who spent three days kind of walking around town waiting for those contractions to strengthen. And it's also unpredictable in its ups and downs. So in a way, when I was planning the book, I, I basically thought, oh, I want a birth in there that's way too fast and scary. And I want a birth that's way too slow and exhausting. And I want one that seems to go beautifully, but then there's one bad outcome. And I want a birth that seems to go horribly, but then everybody's fine. So I wanted to capture the sheer narrative twists of birth. And above all, just honor not only the, the midwives, but the women who do this extraordinary thing. Um, you know, I'm not somebody who's ever done anything physically brave, but I have to say birth for me was like, it sort of stands out like, you know, doing a marathon. It's like these two extraordinary days in my life when I did something I never thought I'd be capable of. So, so I just wanted to, to honor the, the messiness um, and the, the kind of, you know, the, the unpredictability and, and heroism involved in, in, yeah, getting the babies out. Um, I see another interesting question about um, boy babies being weaker. Um, yes, um, I think that's a fairly well-known fact, um, but what, what's much less often talked about was that the flu had such a peculiarly awful effect on women in late pregnancy. And also women just a few weeks after birth too, quite often died of that 1918 flu, um, which we would now understand in terms of like an immune system response, but that was one of those many medical concepts they just didn't have back then. Um, I mean, they didn't even know what a virus was in those days. They were really working in the dark and they were dosing everybody with hot whiskey because they had, they had figured out that um, giving them high doses of aspirin was too dangerous. So really the safest option was whiskey, you know? Um, so yeah, another thing I suppose, you know, relevant to that question of whether boy babies were weaker is I really tried to vary the, the outcomes for the babies too. And, and um, to kind of show that midwives are always focused on, on the mothers and the babies, but you know, one difference is in 1918, they couldn't have been trying to, you know, choose the baby's life over the mothers or anything because babies were so inherently weak um, that really midwives and doctors tended to just focus on trying to save the mother's life so that she might have, have future babies, you know? Um, maybe I could ask you, we've met some of the key characters and we know there's a question, maybe I'll, before we um, go on and maybe I'll ask you to read a little bit from the, the novel. Um, there's a question about the mothers um, and this may relate partly to what you were just saying about taking the story from Julia's point of view. Um, so we don't get to know the back story on all the mothers and they, they come into the ward and they go out of the ward and they have their dramas in that moment. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the variety of, um, of mothers that pass through? Sure, I think a key decision, I mean, the first key decision I made was to set it in a maternity ward. And the second key decision was to make that an inner city hospital where it would be mostly poorer women from the slums. I think that made it more dramatic because um, there's, there's a bit of a gap there between Julia's who's fairly middle-class and educated and these women who are, you know, living in a culture where, you know, you're meant to accept it if he beats you, um, you're meant to keep pumping out the babies, um, I, I tried to capture that peculiar pro-natalist attitude in Ireland. Um, you know, I, so I, I invented this proverb about, you know, she doesn't love them unless she gives them 12. Uh, you know, my own mother from, uh, from the 50s through to the, the 60s, she had eight of us. And that was just a normal Irish family, you know. So I think these, these women were under pressure from um, 
you know, the Catholic Church and, and the state and even from sort of working class culture to, to prove their worth by, you know, having as many babies as possible and basically giving all the food to the children or the man. And a lot of, a lot of these women didn't even sort of sit down at meals. You know, they just sort of had the scraps off the plate at the end of the meal. So, of course, a lot of them were coming to a pandemic already weakened, already damaged. One woman who dies in the novel, she, she comes in uh, ready for this new birth with her one leg still hugely swollen up from the last birth, you know? So I got very interested in how the body of any one of these patients would have a whole kind of politically political history embedded in it. You know, you could, and, and Julia, you know, even though she's not officially interested in politics, she can't help but see that, you know, um, poverty has weakened them and it's, it's, it's not random whether they live or die. It's, it's very much a matter of, you know, how damaged in advance they are by, by things that the politicians have allowed to happen. So, um, yeah, I, of course, you know, I, I had to be sort of ruthlessly focused. I couldn't follow these women. Um, and so I, I tried to suggest their backstory in some cases or suggest what kind of support they had at home or what kind of house they might be going back to. Um, and one of them in particular, I really don't give any history to because she's the unmarried mother. And that is, is such a kind of stereotyped group. And, you know, when she comes into the hospital, um, I call her Honor White because I suppose she's a kind of scarlet woman. Um, you know, people would have been so quick to judge her as, you know, either, oh, that one's a poor victim, she got raped, or, oh, that one's a well-known slut who, who, you know, works as a sex worker. Um, and I didn't want them to be able to judge her. So I wanted her to stay very, like, to stay stum about it. You know, she, she refuses to explain or to justify herself. All we know is that she's a strict Catholic. She won't take any painkilling drugs. She won't take any alcohol. She doesn't explain how she's on her second um, out, of, out of marriage pregnancy. And um, I, I suppose a bit like with um, Julia's mute brother, I wanted her to have a certain you know, strength in her refusal to speak. Um, and, and I really, I suppose, because I was writing a novel about, about the, the making of babies, I didn't want to buy into all the myths about, you know, the, the normal family. So I wanted to show lots of people who don't fit the normal family, from Bridie, who'd grown up in Ireland's kind of, you know, mother and baby home to orphanage pipeline, um, through to this, this baby who will be born to, to Honor White. Um, so, so yeah, of course, it was tantalizing that I didn't get to give the full story of any of these mothers. But, you know, as in any medical soap opera, I suppose, I tried to evoke them, you know, vividly and fast. Um, I, I love what you were saying about the, um, you know, bringing it down to the level of the body, because it's as if that kind of political history is written on the bodies of those women. Um, and there are these global phenomena happen, you know, pandemic, world war, um, and the rebellion in Ireland, um, but it comes down to those really, really intimate details um, that tell us so much about the lives of individual women and stories that don't normally get told. Well, like for instance, there's an autopsy scene in the book, and and one one reader was critical of that, and she was like, "Oh, why would you, you know, cold-bloodedly show a woman's body being chopped up?" But I was trying to contrast that with the typical quick autopsy scene we see in every detective drama, where you have pretty skinny dead white girl on the slab and she's 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 shown as this very kind of you know brief sexy image of the murdered girl and i thought no i want to have a a detailed slow thorough um session in which the doctor and the nurse are are respecting all the different forms of damage that were done to this middle-aged woman's body you know they're trying to you know kind of decode her figure out what the flu did what the endless childbearing did what the poverty and malnutrition did so it, it's a deliberately sort of unsexy autopsy scene in which they they take the time and the trouble to 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 try and you know interpret what her body is saying to them. Maybe I could ask you to read a little bit from sure, the novel sure. just to give us a taste of it. Yeah. Um, here we go. Here's a little bit from the the very start when Julia's. Uh, she's getting the tram to work. Here's maybe about three minutes of this. The first two trams whizzed by, crammed to bursting. More routes must have been cut this week. When the third came, I made myself push onto it. The steps were slippery with carbolic and my rubber soles could get no purchase. I clung to the stair rail as the tram swayed through the fading darkness and hauled myself upwards. 
the riders on the balcony section looked soaked through, so I ducked in under the roof where a long sticker said, cover up each cough or sneeze, fools and traitors spread disease. I was cooling down fast after my bike ride, starting to shiver. Two men on the knifeboard bench moved a little apart so I could wedge myself between them, bag on my lap. Drizzle slanted in on us all. The tram accelerated with the rising whine passing a line of waiting cabs, but their blinkered horses took no notice. I saw a couple arm in arm below us, hurried through a puddle of lamplight, their bluntly pointed masks as the beaks of unfamiliar birds. Children carrying suitcases were filing into the train station as we swung past, being sent down the country in hopes they would be safe. But from what I could gather, the plague was general all over Ireland. The spectre had a dozen names, the great flu, the khaki flu, the blue flu, the black flu, the grip or the grip. That word always made me think of a heavy hand landing on one's shoulder and gripping it hard. The malady, some called it euphemistically, or the war sickness on the assumption that it must somehow be a side effect of four years of slaughter. A poison brewed in the trenches or maybe spread by all this hurly burly and milling about across the globe. And we've got there. We're getting some great questions tonight, Mania. Here, here's an interesting one from Katrina Tang. You mentioned setting the story in your hometown of Dublin. How much does your home and identity as an Irish Canadian influence your writing? It's one of those questions that would probably be clearer to somebody who studies my work than me. Um, I know that I've sometimes set individual stories in Canada, but I haven't tended to set many of my novels here yet. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is. I just I have be, happen to have been seized by real stories from Ireland and England and America more often. Um, my, um, one of my more autobiographical ones, Landing, is about an Irish woman moving to Canada. So I think that's, that's um, one of the few that's set mostly in Canada. But I think Canada has had a huge effect on my career in basically giving it oxygen because Ireland is a rather small, intense country. It can be quite inward looking. And I think as long as I lived in Ireland, especially as I had the kind of lesbian label to bear, um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that was such a terrible, terrible stigma. It's more like it was a very specialist identity. So I was always having journalists ring me up and say, what do Irish lesbians think? You know. So I think anyone who's from a sort of minority will, will know that burden of representation. And when I moved to Canada, suddenly, you know, I remember CBC interviewers asking me about, you know, my use of the past tense in a book or something. And I was like, they're not even going to ask about the queer thing. They don't care. You know? So I found that the level of um, acceptance and inclusion of, of lesbian and gay and bi people in, in Canadian life has actually allowed me to really get on with writing my books, whatever they are about. It meant I didn't feel like I was in any sense pigeonholed. So maybe not very obviously at the level of content, but at the level of sort of energy and confidence, I think living in Canada for the last, what is it, uh, 22 years has been hugely beneficial. And it's let me feel that I can really sort of write about anything, anytime, anywhere, rather than, you know, making me feel that I'm bound to kind of certain subjects or certain topics or certain identity groups. You know, um, you know, the, the, the loosey goosey nature of Canadian identity has been brilliant for me. It, it let me feel that I could be part of it. And yet that didn't mean I was signing up to any particular list of books I had to write, you know. Uh, there's a question in the, the chat function asking about what you're reading right now. Oh, um, I'm reading biography of Edison because I stayed in his lodging house in Stratford recently for a, a getaway. There's a little hotel there called Edison's and he just struck me as such an interesting weirdo. So I'm currently immersed in a biography of Edison. I, I try and, you know, read out of my knowledge areas and out of my usual genres quite often. You know, I read popular science quite a lot. Um, and I, I also like to read books I come across at random, like in those little free libraries. You know, sometimes I feel a book's been sent to me. Um, and then I get sent lots and lots of fiction by publishers as well. Um, so, um, yeah, quite a mixture of things. Um, but certainly during at the very start of the pandemic, I did find historical fiction quite a comfort, you know, because I was already immersed in Hilary Mantel's um, The Mirror and the Light. And, you know, uh, you know, our, our state of play wouldn't have made um, Thomas Cromwell, um, you know, turn a hair. Uh, his life was so full of, you know, perils. Um, so, you know, a, a setting like Tudor England can really put our terrors into perspective. <laughs> 
Um, maybe I could ask you to talk a little bit about, um, oh, we were talking about bodies and the connections uh, um, of the, 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 the symptoms of the bodies and the, the attention that you pay to individual bodies. I wondered about bodies and stories. Um, there are so many symptoms that tell stories that are so compelling in um, the pull of the stars. Um, the blood pressure, the heartbeat, the color of the skin that changes depending on how sick someone was. I was actually uh, uh, kind of surprised at how much the, the story of tracking those life signs becomes the thing that drives this, the story and the pull of the stars. Well, yeah, for instance, I, 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 um, I named the chapters for the colors of somebody with increasingly bad cyanosis where your, your tissues are starved of oxygen and so you start to darken. Um, I suppose as a novelist, you're always looking for ways to turn what might be a lecture into a story. So where, you know, statistics might be really useful at the level of lecture, with fiction, you always wanted to be vivid in terms of the senses. Um, so, I mean, one thing I came across was the idea that, you know, certain midwives and nurses, they could sort of smell childbirth fever. They could, you know, those very first hints the woman was, was brewing um, an infection after birth, they could smell it. And I was like, oh, Julia, Julia will have that. She'll be like taking little sniffs of them. Um, and similarly, as soon as I came across the idea of, of cyanosis, um, I was like, oh, it's like a color warning system. That's just what I need. So I suppose I would, I would always tend to go for those just highly concrete examples of things, um, especially when you've got a main character who has all this training that the reader won't have. Um, you, you don't want it to sound jargony. You, you're always looking for, for ways in which it can be, you know, something that a child might see, but the difference is that Julia will know how to interpret that too. You know, so she'll see like a, a blue nose or ears and she'll be like, oh, cyanosis, I know what that means. Um, yeah, I, I, I got such a pleasure and a satisfaction from really immersing myself in the medical work for this book. It's funny because when I was growing up, I probably always thought that I was artsy as opposed to sciencey. You know, that seemed the main distinction. But these days with science under such explicit attack from, you know, right wing politics, um, I, I feel very passionately pro-science, actually. I feel as if, you know, I may have ended up with my life in the arts, but, um, you know, science, it seems, is not just a, a neutral thing we all accept now. Science actually needs defending, you know. So in an era of, you know, anti-vaccine nonsense, for instance, it seems really worthwhile to have fiction that explicitly celebrates um, the, the, the glories of something like a vaccine in the face of, you know, random and horrible death. So, so yeah, um, even though the, the medical stuff was quite hard work with this novel, it was, um, you know, it felt like a hugely meaningful thing to be working on. Oh, I've just spotted an interesting question. Yeah. What input did I have into the audiobook? That's an interesting one, Shirley, because um, usually I wouldn't have that much input, but usually the whole thing is done in a fairly leisurely way. They have time to find the actors and they, they send me audio samples of maybe three of them. But in this case, because the book was being rushed out and... Um, my audiobook publisher said to me, um, we can't find any Irish actors. Is it okay if we use an American with a brogue? I was like, no, it's not okay. <laughs> no. So I basically emailed everyone I knew in Ireland in, in the arts and said, I need to find an Irish actor with access to either a home studio or near studio. And this was in March, right? So a couple of weeks in negotiations, and then we found the wonderful Emma Lowe. Um, she's actually the sister of one of the producers of Room. And um, she, she did the, the loveliest kind of um, um, audio sample and uh, they managed to find a, a studio in which she could go in and be directed by someone who was in London, England, who was all very socially distanced in the middle of March, but I was absolutely thrilled with the results and she immediately won an award for it. Um, so I thought just, it, you know, the, the novel is so realistic and having a really precise accent was, was crucial to it. Yeah. There's also a question about the title of the novel. Yeah, The Pull of the Stars. Um, very early on, I suppose, I came across um, the, the, where the word influenza comes from. It basically means influence. It's the influence of the stars. And I don't know for sure if this is true, but it was said to be a medieval Italian um, belief that the stars were literally causing these illnesses. They were sort of zapping us, as it were. And I'd always thought of the stars as being considered to influence us in some you know, more more macro way at the level of fate or love, but the idea that they would actually give you an illness 
you know, in some kind of malign cosmic joke. Um, I thought that was a fascinating one. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll call it the pull of the stars, like the influence of the stars. Um, but that means I have to have a scene with stars in it. So I thought, OK, where, where can you see the stars? They'll have to go up on the roof. And so very early on, the, the title caused me to, to build in that long scene on the rooftop um, where Julia and Bridie finally have a bit of time to themselves. And it was crucial to me to give them and to give everyone a bit of a break from the ward. You know, it's almost like I thought of the reader's experience as rather like birth, you know, that, that you can have grueling periods and, and long um, chapters to match the long shift in which everything's so like nonstop, all these different women with their different needs. And then it was absolutely crucial to have little tea breaks and, and one quite long rest before the last chapter, because I was always thinking about the reader's the reader's stamina along with Julia's stamina, you know. Um, and somebody was asking in the questions about, about Julia and Bridie, and um, I don't want to give too much away about it, but I would say that, yes, from the very beginning, um, I was planning for, for their relationship to be quite transformative, because I was really interested to see, as it were, how much could change in three days. You know, it was almost a sort of a, um, a test for myself to see if I could just start from scratch and have people get to know each other and have a huge effect on each other's lives all in a couple of days. You know, I, I always thought that, thought of the maternity ward in this book as rather similar to the trenches for men in the war. You know, that it, it was clearly a space of horror, and yet so many of them looked back on it with nostalgia because of the astonishingly intense bonding with these these men for whom for whom they'd risk risk their lives. The constellation, the idea of the stars and the cosmos, and the sort of the big, big picture versus, you know, the consistency of the sputum that's on the floor um, uh, is that it is evoked also in um, Julia's um, watch that she engraves with the um, with the moons in a kind of a memorial to the women that she's Yeah, whenever Julia has, loses a patient, she scratches little mark on her watch. I suppose I wanted to show her as very, you know, pragmatic and stays in the moment and always on to the next thing, but I didn't want her to seem ruthless. So I liked the idea that, you know, no matter how obscure or poor or, you know, forgotten her patients are or babies who don't even get named before they're buried, you know, she marked them down that she has an almost, I thought of her as an almost kind of priestess figure, you know, who is actually takes deeply seriously her obligation to try and save these women and these babies and who doesn't forget any of them. You know, I think any of us who've ever been looked after by a nurse in hospital, we feel kind of a a craven gratitude to them that we don't even always feel for the doctors because you know we have we have put ourselves in the position of being like babies in their hands you know and we may not know their names or may never see them again but you know they they have they have held us they've got us through so i was trying to kind of honor the almost sacred nature of that relationship between julia and these these women she'll probably never see again and, and one way is to have her yeah mark it on her watch mm -hmm. There is also a question about the um, about Bridie's background in the um, residential school system in Ireland. You know, that would be another example of how Canada affects my thinking, because you might say, you know, Ireland has been doing a lot of sort of examination of its of its basically appalling history of locking up a really high percentage of its um, population. But I was probably all the more aware of that because in Canada, we've done such a lot of thinking about our appalling history with the residential schools. And I found it a really interesting question. In Canada, we see it so clearly as motivated by racism, you know, like the point of the residential schools was genocidal. But in Ireland, we did a very similar thing and there was no ethnic difference. It was just really the, the getting the, the poor off the streets. You know, a, a child who was, you know, making music in the street for pennies would be scooped up and then a judge would send them off to a home. Um, be, you know, they were basically being punished for being poor there. And because we had so many monks and nuns and brothers, um, uh, the Catholic orders basically ran a lot of these institutions, which, um, you know, basically borrowing from the phrase, the school to prison pipeline, I decided Bridie would call it the pipe because um, there was a whole sort of network of these institutions from mother and baby homes um, and Magdalen hospitals where so-called fallen girls would be sent uh, through to orphanages where not everybody was an orphan. You might well have parents you'd been taken away from. And then um, industrial schools or reformatories 
Um, and these were all in some ways punitive. Um, for instance, the mother and baby homes, the theory was that you could just go there and be looked after for free. But actually, these women had to stay on for one year to kind of serve out their time, you know, pay the nuns back for having allowed them to stay during the birth. Um, or if, if it was a second birth, they'd have to stay for two years because it was a longer sentence. Um, so, you know, there was so much about these institutions that was cruel and appallingly abusive. And it wasn't just specifically nuns or priests. They were generally run by Catholic orders, but often staffed by lay people. And to prepare myself for this book, I made myself read the entire Irish government report. It's called the Ryan Report on abuses in these institutions. And, you know, with each of my novels, there's one research task that I think never again, and I wish I could wipe it from my mind, you know. So, so reading this detailed testimony by people who'd survived these institutions um, just turned my stomach. And, you know, for, for filling in Bridie's background, I only used a handful of anecdotes, some of the milder things, rather than the more, you know, um, you know ob obviously sadistic scenes of beating. I tried to keep, you know, scenes in which, for instance, she'd be, you know, slapped for having red hair because that was the devil's color, you know, like small but inexplicable meannesses like that or, you know, punished for sneezing, that sort of thing, or for, for lying in bed in the wrong position. So um, I think it was probably my, you know, my, my background in Canada and in Ireland that gave me that kind of, you know, double fascination with how, how we can have locked up so many um, children um, and done them such harm, you know, mm -hmm. all under the pretext of, of welfare. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about the character of Groin. Poor Groin, what a mean, mean name I gave him. And um, yeah, one thing I like doing with my narrators is even if they are basically likable and skillful and competent, there's always some things they'll get wrong. So I, I like having moments in which they, they misunderstand or they judge. Um, so I, I wanted to evoke the war, not just through uh, Julia's brother, who's mute, but um, the orderlies, I thought it was quite plausible that they would have been off to war as stretcher bearers and they'd be brought back and damaged in some ways. One of them has a, a half metal face, for instance. But Groin appears unscathed. And I liked the idea that Julia would, would dislike him on sight, would hate the fact he's so flippant about death. He's um, actually Groin arises out of um, a, 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 some notes I was keeping on, you know, witty indirect ways they referred to death back then in world war one in particular they had a lot of kind of you know jokey verbs for you know to to go west or join the heavenly choir for instance um and so yeah groin was uh, was a kind of a set of idioms come to life almost i thought he'd be very flippant and he would sing lots of songs and julia would dislike him instantly and she would never think to to find out about his background or what personal griefs he might have and bridie would so so he's almost put in as a as a little kind of you know, tripwire for Julia. Um, and I wanted somebody to put the kind of sexist view, for instance, that um, women shouldn't get the vote. I wanted to suggest some of that tension that even, you know, women who were not overtly suffragette like Julia, they would still find themselves, you know, rather sparring with men. And so, um, you know, I think one of the key conversations in the book is when Groin basically says, you shouldn't have the vote because you lot don't serve, you know, you don't serve the king, you don't risk your lives, you don't pay the blood tax. And Julia's like gesturing around at this, you know, ward covered in the bodily fluids of women. And she's like, we pay the blood tax since the dawn of time, you know. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's, he's a small but kind of key character. He sings as well, doesn't he? He does, yes. I, lots of real songs ended up in this book. I've been doing that ever since um, my novel Frog Music. I think because that was um, about performers, I started bringing in lots of sort of, you know, burlesque songs of the 1870s and songs of the time and then then I realized from reading a lot about it that people back then used to just sort of sing in the street people were not inhibited about leaving music to the professionals um, for instance if a, if a new song came out people would buy the sheet music in the street and sing it themselves there was a feeling that music was something everybody did the way we might feel about mm -hmm. say conversation today you know that you didn't have to leave it to the professionals and um, so I've since then I've always found that you know allowing the songs of the day to kind of just just trickle in a bit like those background posters it's a lovely way to sort of suggest the the concerns of popular culture and um, so for instance in in the pull of the stars you've got some overtly pro war songs you know recruiting songs and you've got one drunk at a bus stop singing a song um called i don't want to be a bloody soldier you know so so instead of staging some argument in which whether or not to enlist was overtly discussed 
it, it's fun to do it, you know, a bit more, uh, a bit more lightly by just, um, you know, echoing a few song lyrics. I remember building a playlist when I was reading Slammerkin uh, for music. Interesting. Um, and uh, I noticed you've got a playlist up for the Pull of the Stars, which I wasn't aware of. I wish I'd known about it before I read the novel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here's a good question from Mary Curran. And um, you mentioned getting advice from a midwife in present day Hamilton. Do you have a sense how different midwifery was in 1918 than it is now? Um, it's a very good question. Um, midwifery is, is an interesting mixture in that there's that ancient tradition of, you know, uneducated, but of course, you know, steeped in the tradition of midwifery, women helping you and as opposed to hospitals. But then you'd also get somebody like Julia Power, who is a trained nurse and qualified in midwifery as well. And so what I was always trying to do was suggest that she is part of this sort of longer tradition of more, um, you know, oral tradition. Um, for instance, something you don't get in any of the books about midwifery from, say, the 1910s, you don't get any mention of counter pressure. But when I was giving birth, I found the midwives were so expert, you know, showing Chris just where to push on my back to really reduce the pain. So I tried to suggest that Julia had a lot of those skills, as well as the ones that the doctors would have put in the books, you know, that she's, she's as it were, got the best of those two traditions. Um, but to answer the question about how different it was now, um, I mean, one obvious difference is that nowadays there's far more of, of, uh, of an emphasis on empowering the woman who's giving birth. So basically, whatever she wants, if she wants to run around and eat chocolate ice cream, nobody's going to stop her. In those days, there was a lot more of, now get into position, missus. And, um, you know, the positions, for instance, were, were tended to be specified according to what country you were in. I mean, literally, the Germans, okay, I'm forgetting the details here, but it was something like the Germans had you lying on the left and the British had you lying on your right side, you know, showing that these, these are not nature's laws. These are very uh, particular societal laws. But um, I would say birth in the 1910s, it, it wasn't as bad as it got later when it was thoroughly medicalized. I mean, by maybe 1950s in America, my sense is that, for instance, you'd be shaved before birth and you might be snipped in advance and so on. In 1910s Ireland, they were still pretty much leaving it to nature, but there was quite a lot of um, you know, emphasis on, on lying the woman down when, when the moment came for the doctor to deliver her. That was how they would say it. Not that she would deliver, but I will come along and deliver Mrs. Donahue, you know? Um, and I tried to suggest that tension um, at moments when Julia, you know, a doctor will dash in and sort of say, oh, that patient is failing to get the baby out. Well, I'll, I'll come back and do an operation. And um, something I, I added at the last minute was um, I'd become aware that in Ireland, they routinely did this appalling operation um, where they would sort of unhinge the woman's pelvis. Um, and this basically allowed her to keep having babies year after year. And I didn't want to include this horrifying operation in my book, but I wanted to be honest about the fact that it happened all the time. So I thought I'll have a doctor come in and say, oh, she'll need one of those operations. I'll just go get my chainsaw. I'm serious. They had little hand cranked chainsaws they used for this. And then, you know, with advice from Dr. Lynn, Julia manages to help the woman get the baby out before it comes to that. Um, so. So yes, and um, there were certainly details that my my modern midwife was just you know goggle eyed at and horrified by some of the things they didn't know back then. Um, but she was she was she was very helpful too on on sort of advising me on what you know the woman who's giving birth might actually be feeling at each point. There's also a question here about given that you're interested in um, in science and reading about popular science, have you ever thought about writing science fiction? You know, I think I tried once for about a page, you know, and it just wasn't working. Oh, no, there's an exception. I have one short story out this year um, set in 40 years time, and it's about a world in which nobody's having babies at all anymore. I was interested in taking, I mean, you know, modern tendencies are to a fewer and fewer babies. And I think it is a, a habit we could easily lose. You know, it's, it's not um, a, a convenient thing to make babies in any sense. It's, you know, it's never a convenient time in any individual life. And it's, I think it is a habit we, we could lose. So I was, yeah, that was a, a speculative exercise in the form of a long short story. Um, but it still, it still reads quite, you know, like our society with just one thing different. I think I would have trouble creating an entirely different world. And I noticed similarly, I enjoy reading fantasy, but I've never written it. I, I seem to need to keep myself rooted in, in, what feels like realism, even if it's from previous eras, which you might say are as far away from me as a fantasy world would be. But, 
but I can kind of trust that I'm getting them right if I've done the work. So yeah, I just don't seem drawn to invented worlds, you know? Could I maybe ask you to um, read a little bit more? Sure. And then we'll turn to some of the questions from the chat and from the Q&A. Sure. Um, here's a little bit from later in the novel. A little tea break when um, Mary O'Reilly, who's a very young mother who's came in so ignorant that she she asked Julia um, when her belly button would be opening for the baby to come out and Julia had to break it to her that it was not coming out that way. Um, that's one of those many details you might think I've made up, but not a bit. That was some anecdote from, I think, 1940s Dublin of a mother who didn't know where the baby was coming out. So, yeah, here's a, a rare sort of quiet moment in the ward. I made tea all round. Delia Garrett wanted three biscuits, which I took as a sign of life. When Bridie returned, she slurped her tea and sighed. Lovely. I sipped mine and tried to appreciate the flavour of wood chip and ash. It's really not lovely, Bridie, I said. Before the war, people would have spat this stuff out. Well, but you brewed it fresh for us, she pointed out, and three sugars. I wondered how many spoonfuls the boarders at her mother house convent were allowed, one each. And a biscuit, she said. You're a tonic, Bridie, I said. You're just what the doctor ordered. Have another biscuit if you like. You must be half dead. She grinned. Not even 1% dead, remember? I stand corrected, I said. We are all of us 100% alive. I drank my tea down, thinking, dust of the Indies. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw that Mary O'Rahilly had dropped off. I went over, rescued her baby from the crook of the mother's elbow and set her in the crib. Bridie murmured, like the story. Which story? I asked. About the mother who comes back. From where? I asked. You know, Julia, the other side, she said. I finally got it. She's dead, this mother in the story. Bridie nodded. The baby won't stop crying in the story, so the mammy comes all the way back from the other side to nurse it. I knew some ghost stories, but not that one. I watched the O'Rahilly baby. I wondered how long had the spectral mother in the story stayed with her child? Not for good. That wouldn't be allowed. Maybe all night, though. Maybe till cockcrow. I'll leave that there. I do apologize for this being such a sad book, by the way. Um, I often feel quite mean to my readers. All I can say is I have a strong kind of instinct of what needs to happen and and I need to serve that even though I know I'm causing you personal distress. So That actually was a question that I had that I thought about asking was how do you um, how do you negotiate telling such difficult, sad, um, often, I mean, in the moment there's often hopelessness um, stories uh, and how do you kind of find a balance in the story I mean in this case you have birth and you have death but and they're often right in the same room next to one another yeah it's funny I obviously I, I do give some thought to what my readers are going through and and what they will want and like I'm not I'm not indifferent to that um, I quite often think about which things would be unbearable to my readers, for instance. For instance, I would never have written a story like Room and then have the escape attempt fail and have them locked up again at the end. I just, I wouldn't see any point in that. It would feel like a dead end. So I think a lot about, you know, my readers in ways of, in a way, compensating them for their trouble. They're literally investing their concentration and their energy. And I know that my readers are not typically, you know, spending the entire day at the cottage getting to read under perfect circumstances. They're finding moments in their busy day and often at the end of their busy day um, for my book. And so I want them to be clear about what's going on. For instance, I, I don't write deliberately difficult books um, and I want them to feel, you know, rewarded or comforted, but equally I want them to feel gripped. And so I, I put them through a lot of dark stuff. And sometimes in the case of, you know, who lives and who dies, I'm just following a very instinctive sense of, of what's 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 right in the pattern what fits um you know like like tracing a pattern in a carpet so it's not like i'm thinking oh will my readers all want this baby to survive it's more like i feel oh that has to happen there because it's the right shape you know it's it's not, i don't feel i'm being very articulate about this and then you know given that something sad is going to happen i think okay i'll then give my readers a bit of a break or I'll, you know, ease things off or use a bit of humor there or bring in a moment sweetness there. So I might tinker with the tone, 
but at the level of, of what happens, I'm, I'm just trying to make a pleasing shape. Um, and the thing about writing fiction is if you, if you put in enough little, um, little hints of something in advance, even if the reader doesn't consciously add them all up, um, when, when the thing happens at the end, it'll sort of click into place. It's almost like a rhyme. You know, if you've set up the pattern in advance, um, it, it just it feels inevitable. It feels well-shaped, is all I can say. Um, but I, I do quite often feel, feel um, bad too. But you know, it's funny that when I get complaining emails from readers, it's quite often because I've put in a happy ending. Um, a couple of times readers have written to me and said, I loved your book until suddenly a totally improbable thing happened at the end. <laughs> so readers are not all in agreement about what feels, what feels right to them. You know? Well, and to be fair, that there's a lot of, there's a, it's a bleak story, um, but there's a lot of hopefulness in it. Um, and there is, you know, it's punctuated with um, moments of hope and there's an arc of hope to the story that's really redeeming um, without getting into any of the, the details of how the narrative develops. Well, one uh, thing I found, Menina, was that if you're setting a book, you know, on a lovely island resort or, um, you know, a nice family Christmas or something, you need conflict. You're going to have to have people fighting mm -hmm. over the turkey fairly quickly or else that's a bland sentimental story. But if you're setting a novel in a flu ward, you can actually have people behave very decently. And, um, you know, Bridie is really immediately helpful. Julia's, you know, once she get gets over her slight crankiness at the start when, when um, Bridie breaks the thermometer by boiling it, you know, she's pretty nice to her too. The doctor's pretty nice. The, the women are all pretty kind to each other because, you know, death is stalking the room. And there, there's already an enemy. There's already a conflict. So you can actually have people behave pretty graciously to each other. Um, so that's, that's one kind of tiny compensation is that moment by moment, there's a huge amount of kind of tact being shown. Even like if one of the women is in the middle of giving birth, the other women just sort of naturally turn their heads away to try and give her a little bit of privacy. So, so at the level of human interaction, you can create quite a lot of sweetness so long as there are going to be some horrible um, losses. And I did try and get that balance right. You know, this is a pandemic, so it, it had to feel real. There had to be moments of absolute heartbreak, or frankly, I wouldn't be being true to the fact that so many people lost a loved one in that pandemic and in all pandemics. Um, well, there's also, it, with historical fiction, the feeling that I, I know when I was reading this at the height of the pandemic, that this, this happened and they got past it and um, history unfolded um, past this moment. And in some ways I found that really, really reassuring when reading this in the middle of a pandemic. I'm so glad. Here's an interesting question from Victoria Burnett um, about whether Julia, for much of the book, seems asexual. You know, that would be an example of how when you're writing historical fiction, you're, you're wonderfully freed from the labels of today. One thing I like about writing about the past is that they, they didn't label things to do with, say, human sexuality so much. Um, so you can just describe the feelings as they arrive and describe the, the person's reactions to those feelings, but they don't have to have an identity label. We're a very labeling era. And I really don't think in 1918, people were, you know, even if concepts like, you know, homosexual or heterosexual or even bisexual were around, I don't think everybody was, was, was ticking a box. Um, I think, you know, a woman might ask herself a very concrete question like, you know, do I want to get married and have children? Um, but if she didn't, I think it was possible to, to live in a kind of a, you know, career girl zone or a spinster zone or, a, you know, wait and see, sure, I'm only 29 kind of zone. I don't think people were labeled in the same way. Um, and when you go back even farther, that's even more true. So, um, um, for instance, um, my novel Life Mask is set in the 1780s and 1790s. One of my characters is Horace Walpole, who nowadays we would probably think of as, you know, very obviously screaming queen, gay man of the 18th century. But in his in his later years, he, he got besotted with this young woman, Mary Berry. And so, you know, I really enjoyed writing um, this very kind of, you know, theatrical, over the top, playful, effeminate, scholarly man who was really in, in many ways madly in love with this young woman. 
Um, and that there was just that was a very unlabeled kind of relationship. And I thoroughly enjoyed being able to get into the nitty gritties of it without having to sort of decide what category he was in, you know. So so, yeah, even though it might seem like historical fiction focuses a lot on sort of what people wore and what their food were was and so on. Actually, mostly what we're trying to get right is the psychology of the times. And I think in, in Julia's day, there was a huge emphasis on, you know, just get on with your work. You know, they were their stamina was amazing. That's sort of, you know keep calm and carry on kind of mentality and the kind of dark humor of, you know, oh, things have got a little bit dicey, the bombs are falling, but we press on, you know, and you might say they, they hid their feelings compared with us, but they were also wonderfully tough compared with us. And Julia is, the, uh, during the course of the three days of the novel, Julia is, has her 30th birthday. So she is at that kind of crucial point where she's deciding what's going to, she, you know, what she is the next step for her or what choices she makes. And above all, she's madly busy. Um, it, it's, um, I, I really, I like, I like writing novels about women in which they're not thinking about their relationships all the time, because, you know, that's, that's traditionally been the focus for women is, you know, oh, sort of, forget about your job, but tell us about your love life. So I really like taking women's jobs seriously in books like this. And of course, you know, their relationships matter too, but in a way they happen more slightly off to one side because the women have found work to do that is meaningful, even if it's not very well paid. And I really try and sort of honor that choice by, by making the focus be on, on the work. And um, I also like the fact that, you know, love could kind of sneak up on you while you're working so hard. Um, because it wasn't something you thought to to either look out for or to ward off, you know, because the, the focus is on the work. Here's a great question. From your research, what was the largest takeaway that you could use in handling and proceeding through the current pandemic? Hmm. Well, yeah, I think that the biggest thing that that came out for me was the notion that I probably went into writing this book thinking, oh, a pandemic, such a fascinating leveler, it could just death could kill anyone. But of course, once I started looking at the actual nitty gritties of um, life, say, in the Dublin slums, I realized that if 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 women were coming into this ward already so, you know, weak and lack of calcium, you know, their, to their teeth falling out, um, um, you know, many systems in their body under strain from, from lack of food, um, from too much work, from too much childbirth, you know, of course they would be hit much harder by this apparently random virus than if they were rich and pampered. And, and in particular, I found myself resenting so many of those bits of government advice about, you know, lie down and have yourself nursed for two weeks, you know, um, just the, the complete ignoring of the realities of the lives of the poor. And so this year, I find that the headlines I've really been noticing are those ones that remind me of 1918 in that, you know, it's, it's just ignoring the realities of families who live several family to an apartment or, you know, have to, you know, share a, a lift with everybody else in their building or have to go out to work or have to be in situations where, you know, working in a restaurant and the customers aren't wearing their masks. You know, I'm, I'm so aware of the politics of the pandemic, partly because I paid close attention to this other pandemic 100 years ago. So then um, I suppose when when the Black Lives Matter protest took on such an amazing kind of, you know, global reach um, this summer, I thought that was so interesting. It wasn't at all the, the obvious effect you would have expected the COVID pandemic to have, but it's as if at a moment like this, we realize the status quo is not, you know, is, is, is not, either obvious or permanent. We realize that it's just one set of social arrangements and um, it's as if we all had enough time to actually do some thinking about um, the realities of our society. And, you know, um, that, that's been such an interesting takeaway for me this year. So I'm really glad that my novel um, focused so much on, on, on the lives of Julia's um, poorer patients because I think it makes it a much more interesting story than if it was just truly random living and dying and you know the luck of, of the stars as it were i suppose i'm saying that you know it's it's not really the stars that decide who lives and dies it's it's probably our votes and budgets and you know realities like that um, and that to, to blame it on the stars or god's will you know that's that's really avoiding the fact that we we vote for the, these outcomes these are great questions we're getting aren't they, they? are 
It's like some in-depth seminar. It's fantastic. <laughs> like nobody said, where did you get your ideas? <laughs> I'm deeply grateful. Oh, Anna Paula wants to know, was The Wonder going to be turned into a film? Glad you asked. Yes. Um, I, I can't announce dates yet, but I would say I have half a dozen film or TV projects, which I've taken on since Womb. Some of them adapting other people's books, some of them adapting my own. And I would say The Wonder is closer to actually being filmed than anything else. Um, obviously, everything still depends on COVID, but it has got fairly close. Um, and, and again, I really enjoyed the experience of adapting that. Um, so fingers crossed for that one. Yeah. Um, you, Chris, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask what you're working on now, aside from those adaptations. Strangely enough, Manina, I'm trying to write a musical. I'm collaborating with a composer, um, from, you know, collaborating on the lyrics and the composer doing the music and me doing the book. It's a totally new form for me, and I feel like a, a complete beginner, which is a, it's a state of mind that's very um, that's very good for for creation. I find you don't want to get smug or rest on your laurels, you know. So um, I would say since since publishing Room in particular, I felt the need to try new things so that I don't um, you know sit around going I wrote a bestseller. Um, so writing the film of Room made me feel like an idiot in a good way. Um, writing uh, ch children's books. Had the same had the same effect you know that beginner mind that the buddhists talk about and now writing a musical um it's 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 very similar um did so you have what am i doing but i'm so enjoying it did you have much to do with the musical um elements of the adaptation of room for the stage no i didn't write the songs in any sense but i suppose probably that was my gateway drug in that when our director cora Bissett suggested adding songs to the story of room i i would not have seen that coming but she very quickly persuaded me that in the case of Room, the songs might really work as a kind of um, intense release valve for all the secrets that Ma can't share with Jack. So the songs serve a very particular purpose in that story. And it worked so well that, um, you know, I've been asked since, would I license versions of the play with the songs taken out? And I said, no, you can't do it. You know, the songs are crucial in the story now. Um, so, yeah, that probably made me think more about about plays with songs um, and even you know plays that are not labeled as musicals the songs are crucial in them i'm thinking of something like um the penelope ad which uh you know i saw the grand last year you know so even if it's uh, even if a, a theater piece is not specifically labeled as being a play with songs um, the, the songs are often a crucial part of it so yeah that probably sort of opened my eyes to to the musical as a form and also our, our 13 year old is so into musicals um and i watch lots of them with her and so on so so that's that's helped too my you know our kids have had an influence on everything i've written in the last 17 years <laughs> will the play uh of Rumi remounted it is fervently hoped and planned yes yeah absolutely it should come back to canada Oh, I see Kirsten Smith wants to know, do I have my character's main story arcs plotted out before I started? Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge planner and I don't think this takes the fun out of it at all because things can change. Um, as we saw with Dr. Lynn, I was trying to keep her politics well out of it, but they surged in. So there's always room for change. Um, in Slammerkin, for instance, I, I tried to represent a very realistic 18th century household, including a manservant. And before I knew it, my main character and the manservant were kind of flirting with each other and I had not intended that in any way but I, I couldn't stop them so I, I did a further draft in which they had a, a brief doomed love affair so um there's always room for variation but if I find if you don't plan it's likely to be wobbly you know a, a book really needs a structure you might be able to write a short story just on impulse um but but a book is a big thing and I certainly find I can't do that kind of shaping just on the hoof as I go along I need to have decided in advance what the main things are that will happen. Yeah. What does the shaping look like? To um, draw pictures, storyboard. No, no, and it's it's not it's not notes stuck on a board. Um, I I use a program called Scrivener, so I, I I gather little files on everything, but then I start to group them into you know chapter one, chapter two, and I I literally I write out what's going to happen in each chapter, and in particular what new things the reader learns. Because if I find I'm, you know, giving away lots of secrets in a row in chapter three, I might be like, okay, let's put one of those in chapter one. So I, I sort of move the plot points around. Um, and and nowadays I, I plan more and more, I would say. I spend years on end really deciding, you know, how much the story should cover and who the point of view should be and what will happen where. Um, and so, you know, the, the, um, 
how it varies tends to be relatively subtle, like someone like letting Dr. Lynn talk about her politics more, but the kind of basic story points will have been decided in advance. And some writers don't need to do this, but I definitely do. I don't think I'm naturally very good at plot, so I need to very consciously mull over and, and shape the plots to try and, you know, strip them down to their leanest. Um, you know, if it, I could have been, I could have done four days uh, for this book, but if I didn't need four, why include four? You know, if you can get it down to three, so much the better. Okay. Um, I have, I'm going to maybe ask one more question. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm choosing among all my post-it notes that I have <laughs> surrounding my screen. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, what you're taking from the pull of the stars into your next project. Um, is are you thinking like of continuing to write historical fiction? I I have about um, six books lined up, and they they won't all make it. You know, um, some some books stay endlessly in my queue as other books jump the queue. And um, but what I can tell you is that for a long time now they've kind of toggled between historical and contemporary settings. I would say maybe either half or sometimes two thirds of my ideas that I get obsessively interested in are historical, um, but, but contemporary ones always arise again. So I try to just alternate these a bit so that I don't have you know, a long run of one kind or another. Um, and I would say, strangely enough, I don't seem to be writing short stories much anymore, apart from the, the recent one about the world with no babies. Um, it's as if, because I'm doing so much writing for film and TV, um, I seem to kind of naturally go between um, my my fiction writing and then screenwriting has become my my other my other thing. Where short stories short stories used to be my my kind of break from the novel. Um, I mean, I would say I. It's not that I have difficulty writing, but I certainly need little breaks, and I sometimes, for no good reason, will suddenly let myself wander off for a couple of days and research a future possible book um, when I'm meant to be working hard on this one. Uh, it's as if I need to I need to play hooky sometimes. And instead of just not writing, what I do is I, I go write something else or make plans for some future writing. So it's it, it, it's a way of sort of allowing the brain a lot of, um, you know, small freedoms um, while knowing that still ultimately I'll get the book written. You don't want it to feel too much like a day job. <laughs> Even if, in fact, you do it all day, seven days a week. <laughs> all right, I think that brings us to the end of our time. These um, were superb um, questions, really. I, I don't always yeah, get such, such detailed questions. They're amazing. Thank you to everybody who um, put in questions and who talked in the comments. Our moderator has reminded us that you can get any of Emma's books through the link to the uh, bookstore. Um, and that just leaves it to me to thank Emma very much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and to hear about your past work and what's coming up in the future. Um, so I'll just say stay safe, everybody. And thank you, Emma. It's been a treat. Thank you all. Bye, Menina. Thank you. Bye.